Hello everyone, I'm Billy. And I'm Comron. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors and the creators of the Malazan Brotherhood. Today we will be discussing Book 4, Chapter 20 of Deadhouse Gates, a novel in the Malazan Books of the Fallen. This is Part 1 of our coverage of this chapter. This podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it is most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Both Billy and I know Preach. this to be the best fantasy story ever written and want to share our love of the series with you. Now, we will be covering the events of these books in a linear fashion, so there will be spoilers for those that have not read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book, but that ship has already sailed. I keep dropping spoiler after spoiler. <laughs> Nothing major. But, uh, you know, our, our days without incident are down to zero, so thanks to me. So we're moving along. <laughs> A quick warning, today's episode contains descriptions of extreme violence. Listener discretion is advised. And our show is listener supported. If you'd like to support us, we would really appreciate that. So you can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we are posting ad-free episodes on Patreon weekly. Also, we'd really like to hear from you. Send any feedback or comments to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. All right, chapter 20, part one. The chapter begins with a quote. This path's a dire thing. The gate it leads to is like a corpse over which 10,000 nightmares bicker their fruitless claims. End quote. And this is from The Path by none other than Trout Sen Al Bakarala. <laughs> I'm really coming around to the idea that this may in fact be Moby, like you suspect. Right, right. That's too funny. Because it's, yeah, I feel like the, he's writing from a distant future. <laughs> about this like it's a long time ago yeah who else would be writing about this path yeah and none that i know of so it's got to be him dude yeah we are taken to kalam on the rag stopper seagulls wheeled above them the first they'd seen in a long while an uneven smudge grew steadily on the horizon even as sunset approached not a single cloud marred the sky and the wind was brisk and steady salk elan joined kalam on the forecastle. Both of them were wrapped in cloaks against the rhythmic spray kicked up by Ragstopper's headlong plunge into the troughs. To the sailors' manning station, the sight of them standing there at the bow like a pair of great ravens was black rot with omens. Oblivious to all this, Kalam's gaze held on the island that awaited them. Salkilan said, By midnight, ancient birthplace of the Malazan Empire. Kalam snorted. He asked, Ancient? How old do you think the Empire is? Hood's breath! Elan said, all right, too romantic by far. I was but seeking a mood. Kalam asked, why? Elan shrugged and said, no particular reason, except perhaps this brooding atmosphere of anticipation. Nay, impatience even. Kalam asked, what's to brood about? Elan said, you tell me, friend. Kalam grimaced and said nothing. Elan said, Malas City, what should I expect? Kalam said, imagine a pigsty by the sea and that'll do. A rotten, festering, bug-ridden swamp. Elan said, all right, all right. Sorry I asked. Kalam asked, the captain? Elan said, no change, alas. Kalam thought, why am I not surprised? Sorcery. Gods, how I hate sorcery. Elan rested long-fingered hands on the rail, revealing once again his love of green-hued gems set in gaudy rings. He said, a fast ship could take us across to Unta in a day and a half. Kalam asked, and how would you know that? Elan said, I asked a sailor, Kalam, how else? That salt-crusted friend of yours pretending to be in charge. What's his name again? Kalam said, I don't recall asking. Elan said, it's a true, admirable talent, that. Kalam asked, what is? Elan said, your ability to crush your own curiosity, Kalam. Highly practical in some ways, dreadfully risky in others. You're a hard man to know, harder even to predict. Kalam said, that's right, Elan. Elan said, yet you like me. Kalam asked, I do? Elan said, aye, you do, and I'm glad, because it's important to me. Kalam said, go find a sailor if you're that way, Elan. Elan smiled and said, that is not what I meant, but of course you're well aware of that. You just can't help flinging darts. What I'm saying is, I enjoy being liked by someone I admire. Kalam spun around. He said, What do you find so admirable, sulky Lan? In all your vague suppositions, have you discovered a belief that I'm susceptible to flattery? Why are you eager for a partnership? Elan said, Killing the Empress won't be easy. But just imagine succeeding. 
achieving what all thought to be impossible. Oh yes, I want to be a part of that, Kalam Makar. Right there alongside you, driving blades into the heart of the most powerful empire in the world. Kalam quietly said, You've lost your mind. Kill the Empress? Am I to join you in this madness? Not a chance, sulky Lan. Elan sneered. Spare me the dissembling, Kalam asked. What sorcery holds this ship? Elan's eyes widened involuntarily. Then he shook his head and said, Beyond my abilities, Kalam, and Hood knows I've tried. I've searched every inch of Porm Qual's loot, and nothing. Kalam asked, The ship herself? Elan said, Not that I could determine. Look, Kalam, we're being tracked by someone in a warren. That's my guess. Someone who wants to make certain of that cargo. A theory only, but it's all I've got. Thus, friend, all my secrets unveiled. Kalam was silent a long moment. Then he shook himself and said, I have contacts in Malice City. An unexpected converging well ahead of schedule. But there it is. Elan said, Contacts? Excellent. We'll need them. Where? Kalam said, There's a black heart in Malice City. The blackest. The one thing every denizen avoids mention of. Willfully ignores. And there, if all goes well, we will await our allies. Elan said, Let me guess. The infamous tavern called Smiley's, once owned by that man who would one day become an emperor. The sailors tell me the food is quite awful. Kalam stared at Elan in wonder as he thought, Hood alone knows, either breathtakingly sardonic or... Or what, by the abyss? Kalam said, No, a place called the Dead House, and not inside it, but at the gates. Though, by all means, Sulky Land, feel free to explore its yard. <laughs> Elan leaned both arms on the rail, squinting out at the dull lights of Malice City. He said, Assuming a long wait for your friends, perhaps I shall, perhaps I shall at that. It was unlikely he noticed Kalam's feral grin. What do you think Kalam meant that there is an unexpected converging ahead of schedule? How could he know anything about Fiddler's progress? I'm not sure, unless, and this is a big what if, and we, they would have brought it out and said it if they used those chain chamel bone dagger conference, teleconference daggers. <laughs> And there's, you know, they they would have they would have specifically mentioned that. The only time we saw Kalam speak with somebody like Quick Ben was through the shaved knuckle, but that seemed to be a one-time use, right? Yes, that's correct. The Kachain Shamal bone daggers, the one that they had was with Whiskey Jack. The other one was with Dujack. So neither Kalam nor Fiddler brought that with them. Oh, that's right. The only communication that we saw was Quick Ben and Kalam in the hold. Then. Yeah, that's the only thing I could think of. Unless uh, I don't know. One thing I wanted to ask you. How much of this flattery is legitimate from Sulky Land, in your opinion? Um, I don't know. Part of me likes Sulky Land, and part of me just, yes, you know, I don't like him. I, I, I'm like Kalam. There's no reason to trust this guy. He's deadly. If he gives Kalam the willies, he gives me the willies. I'm really torn because in some ways I think he might be telling the truth that he really respects Kalam. Part of it feels legitimate because I think there is a definitely a mutual respect because we have two extremely talented individuals, let's just say, at what they do, which I think they're both obviously trained assassins at, at, at minimum. So there is like a mutual respect and there's also a mutual fear of each other, I feel. But I don't know how much Lan is trying to get him to lower his guard or what. That's what I think is probably happening is he's really just trying to get him to trust him in some way, even though Kalam is yeah. not doing it. <laughs> no, he's not having none of it. We go to Tremor Lore. Iskarl Pust gripped the latch with both hands, his feet planted against the door, and, gibbering his terror, pulled <laughs> frantically to no avail. With a growl, Mappo stepped over Akarium where he lay at the foot of Tremorlor's entrance and prized Puss from the unyielding barrier. And that, that's a pretty funny picture with Puss planting his feet on the door and trying to open it. Oh, yes. This is like my trash chute at work. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's it's about dangerous. that bad. It, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> it's really bad. I, unfortunately, I don't have to do that. I'm strong enough to kind of one arm it, but I have some ladies that work there that are, I promise you, there's a couple ladies that I don't think they're 120 pounds soaking wet. And they've both told me, I just got to put my foot on the wall. <laughs> Would you mind closing that for me? Open? I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Fiddler heard Mappo straining at the latch, but the sapper's attention was fixed on the swarm of blood flies. Tremorlor was resisting them, but the advance was inexorable. Blind stood at his side, head lifted, hackles raised. The four other hounds had reappeared on the trail and were now charging toward the yard's vine-wreathed gate. The shadow cast down by the divers swept over them. Apslar calmly said, 
It either opens at the touch or it does not open at all. Stand back, Mappo. Let us all try. Crocus cried out, Ikarium stirs! Mappo said, It's the threat. God's below. Not here. Not now. Puss shrieked, No better time! <coughs> Mappo could just crack Ikarium on the head again before he fully awakens, if it was that bad of a situation where they wanted to keep him under. That's what I'm thinking. Uh, but I'm thinking one of these days that's not going to do the trick. <laughs> Uh, I'm thinking one of these days, Akarim's going to say, "What did you crack me in the head for, man?" Before he wipes out, and before he wipes out a big chunk of people. But a quick question here: I, I just now had the blood fly divers, which is disgusting in and of itself. So if they bite you, is that? I mean, dude, do they implant in you like the regular blood flies, and there are they just replicas of themselves eating you from the inside out, or do or what? And they become more? They grow more? I, that's that's disgusting. That's disgusting. <laughs> I think that would be horrific if they had the capacity to plant a seed of their consciousness as well yeah. with the egg. I don't know how anything could be more powerful than that if that is truly how it propagates itself. I hope not yeah. because that would just probably be the most powerful entity from a replication perspective that we've ever yeah. seen. Because it would be bigger than this, than what we're seeing if it could do that, I think, wouldn't it? <laughs> it's pretty big already. Yeah, but I mean, it would be bigger than that if it was propagating itself like that. Like, I mean, it would be like a continent-wide size of flies, wouldn't it? Think how powerful. Possibly, but think about it this way. If it is not that robust of a body, which blood flies are not, That's they're true. probably also easier to kill by things like fire mages or some That's other true. magics that is an yeah, AoE yeah, effect. True. That's true. I didn't even think about that. A fireball would take out a good chunk of them. Maybe it balances out in the end. Yeah, I think it, you're probably right. It probably does even out pretty good. Okay. Absalar spoke again. Crocus, you're the last to try, but Fiddler, come here, quickly. The silence that followed told Fiddler all he needed to know. He risked a glance back to where Mappo crouched over Akarium. Fiddler said, awaken him or all is lost. Mappo lifted his face and Fiddler saw the anguished indecision writ there. Mappo said, this close to Tremorlor. The risk, Fiddler. Fiddler began to say, what? But he got no further. As if speared by lightning, Ikarian's body jolted, a high-pitched keening rising from him. The sound buffeted the others and sent them tumbling. Fresh blood streaming from the wound on his head and his eyes struggling to open, Ikarian surged to his feet. The ancient, single-edged longsword slipped free, the blade's strange, shivering blur. That's interesting. Almost like his power is being channeled through the sword. This is almost to my point earlier, especially when whatever happened was strong enough to buffet them, I'm assuming maybe, and send them tumbling. You may not could reach him to knock him out. And yet it's a weird point about his sword being the Warren. That would explain why he never shatters his sword, I guess. Because think about that. His sword should have broken a long time ago. Right. As hard as this old fella hits, at least I'm assuming if he's hitting hard enough to wipe out cities, I mean, I'm assuming that maybe why his sword, this is, I guess, I never thought about this. This is, again, harkens back to my, where I, I'm dying to ask Mr. Erickson this, if he's read a bunch of the Michael Moorcock stuff, because this is so similar to Elric's blade in a way. Well, Elric's is different, but just kind of, there's things that just leak over into this fantasy world. I just love <laughs> Mm -hmm. It's almost like the blade is infused with the magical energy from Ikarium and thereby strengthened so it can't yeah. shatter like a normal weapon would. Yeah, that's horrific. And especially because Ikarium, I am curious to know his power levels. Like who can you, you know, can we compare him to like elders or, you know, is he outclass them? I get the impression that he almost outclasses them because of everyone's fear of him. There would be some implications if that is true. Yeah, that's true. I can't really talk about it now. The hounds and the divers swarm breached the yard simultaneously. The grounds and ragged trees erupted, chaotic webs of root and branch twisting skyward like black sails, billowing, spreading wide. The other roots snapped out for the hounds. The beasts screamed. Blind was gone from Fiddler's side down among her kin. And I was truly surprised that Tremorlor went for the hounds. <laughs> I couldn't help itself, yeah. I guess. Yeah, it's... Uh, well, I'm assuming imprisoning ancient gods and ascendants is hungry business <laughs> so mm -hmm. gotta take it where you can get it <laughs> that would be a cool visual with the roots and branches reaching out to capture the soul taken in divers here oh yeah i was thinking in this specific case it's turning into this 
sail like feature that can capture those blood flies. Right. So it's a little bit different than just grabbing a big thing running through the maze. Yeah, that's very true. This would be a lot better. Uh, do you take it that the Azath achieve some kind of sustenance from what they imprison? Originally, I thought that. But based off of the earlier conversation, I got a little confused because I thought that trying to contain so many ascendants would be challenging for it. Right. And so if it was truly feeding on them, I would think that it would be getting stronger and stronger. But given That's the true. assault that it's under right now, it almost made it sound like it wasn't capable of holding all of them. Yeah, it's, you're right. I think I, you're, you're correct on that. Back to your point about the cool visuals here. <laughs> in this whole chapter, where they're in Tremolor's grounds, in this maze-type structure, this whole thing needs to be on the screen. Definitely cool. A little bit like Pan's Labyrinth, almost. I think I get yeah. a lot of the same visual imagery from that. Yeah, very twisted. At that moment, in the midst of all he saw, Fiddler grinned inwardly. He thought, not just Shadow Throne for treachery, how could an Azath resist the Hounds of Shadow? A hand gripped Fiddler's shoulder. Apslar hissed, The latch! Try the door, Fid! The diver struck Tremorlor's last desperate defense. Wood exploded. Fiddler was pushed against the door by a pair of hands on his back, catching a momentary glimpse of Mappo, his arms wrapped around a still mostly unaware Ikarium, holding the jag back even as the keening sound rose and with it an overwhelming, inexorable power burgeoned. The pressure slapped Fiddler against the door's sweaty, dark wood and held him there in effortless contempt, whispering its promise of annihilation. He struggled to work his arm toward the latch, straining every muscle to that single task. Hounds howled from the farthest reaches of the yard, a triumphant outrage sound that rose toward fear as Ikarium's own rage swallowed all else. Fiddler felt the wood tremble, felt that tremble spread through the house. His sweat mingling with tremorlores, Fiddler gave one last surge of all his strength, willing success, willing the achievement of moving his arm, closing a hand on the latch, and failed. Behind him, another blood-curdling noise reached through, that of the blood flies, breaking through the wooden nets, coming ever closer, only moments from clashing with Ikarium's deadly anger. Fiddler thought, the jag will awaken then, no other choice, and our deaths will be the least of it. And the Azath, the maze and all its prisoners, oh, be very thorough in your rage, Ikarium, for the sake of this world and every other. Stabbing pain lanced the back of Fiddler's hand. Fiddler thought, blood flies! But there was a weight behind it. Not stings, but the grip of small claws. Fiddler cocked his head and found himself staring into Moby's fanged grin. Moby made his way down the length of Fiddler's arm, claws puncturing skin. The creature seemed to be shifting in and out of focus before Fiddler's eyes, and with each blur the weight on his arm was suddenly immense. He realized he was screaming. Moby clambered beyond Fiddler's hand onto the door itself, reached out a tiny, wrinkled hand to the latch, touched it. Fiddler tumbled onto damp, warm flagstones. He heard shouts behind him, the scrabbling of boots, while the house groaned on all sides. He rolled onto his back, and in the process came down on something that snapped and crackled beneath his weight, lifting to him a bitter smell of dust. It opened! Finally. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Then Ikarium's deathly keening was among them. Tremorlor shook. Fiddler twisted into a sitting position. They were in a hallway, the limestone walls bathed in a dull yellow, throbbing light. Mappo still held Ikarium, and as Fiddler watched, Mappo struggled to retain his embrace. A moment later, Ikarium subsided, slumping once again in Mappo's arms. The golden light steadied, the walls themselves stilled. Ikarium's rage was gone. Mappo sagged to the floor, head hanging over the insensate body of his friend. Fiddler slowly looked around to see if they'd lost anyone. Apslar crouched beside Relok, their backs to the now-shut door. Crocus had dragged a cowering Iskarl pust in with him, and the high priest looked up, blinking as if in disbelief. You know, for all his talk, Crocus is a softy at heart. He could have just locked him out and said, oh, he oh, accidentally yeah. didn't make it in or something, you know? <laughs> yeah, sorry, he didn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. So, yeah, he is kind of a softy. I agree. Good job, Crocus. Fiddler's voice was a croak as he asked, The hounds, Iskarl pust? Pust said, Escaped! And yet, even in the midst of betrayal, they threw their power against the divers. He paused, sniffed the dank air, then asked, Can you smell it? Tremorlor's satisfaction. The divers has been taken. Apslar said, That betrayal might have been instinctive, High Priest. 
Five ascendants in the house's yard, the vast risk to Tremorlor itself, given Shadow's own penchant for treachery. Puss shouted, Lies! We played true! <laughs> Crocus muttered, A first time for everything. He looked across to Fiddler and said, Glad it opened to you, Fid. Fiddler started and searched the hallway. He said, It didn't. Moby opened the door and ripped my arm to shreds in the process. Where is that damned runt? It's in here somewhere. Relock addressed Fiddler. You're sitting on a corpse. Fiddler glanced down to find himself on a nest of bones and rotted clothing. He clambered clear, cursing. Crocus said, I don't see him. You sure he made it inside, Fid? Fiddler said, aye, I'm sure. Crocus said, he must have gone deeper into the house. Puss squealed, he seeks the gate, the path of hands. Crocus said, Moby's a familiar. Puss interrupted, more lies. That disgusting baccarol is a soul taken, you fool. <laughs> Absalar said, relax. There is no gate in here that offers a shapeshift or anything. She slowly rose, her eyes on the withered corpse behind Fiddler, and said, That would have been the Keeper. Each Azath has a guardian. I'd always assumed they were immortal. She stepped forward, kicked at the bones, then grunted, Not human. Those limbs are too long. And look at the joints. Too many of them. This thing could bend every which way. Mappo lifted his head and said, Fork rule assail. Apsilar said, The least known of the elder races, then. Not even hinted of in any Seven Cities legend I've heard. This description of too many joints is what threw us off when List was speaking of a hand with too many joints in his dream. Yes. We initially thought that it belonged to a fork rule of sale. I never envisioned Jagut as having extra joints. And I agree. What's weird with the extra joint thing, when we later will meet the fork rule of sale, that's mentioned multiple times, I believe. In the Jag, it's like it's never, except for here in Deadhouse Gates, I don't recall it being mentioned elsewhere. Yeah, but it was specifically the hand that was referenced. So maybe it's only their hands look weird. Maybe their fingers are longer and they have an extra, maybe they have a third, a third knuckle or, so, or a third joint or something in there. <laughs> Possibly. Apslar swung her attention to the hallway. Five paces from the door, the passage opened on a T-intersection, with double doors directly opposite the entrance. She whispered, the layout's almost identical. Crocus asked, to what? Apslar said, dead house, Malice City. Pattering feet approached the intersection, and a moment later Moby scampered into view. He flapped up and into Crocus's arms. Crocus hugged him and said, he's shaking. Fiddler muttered, oh great. Puss knelt a few paces from Mappo and Acarium. He hissed, The Jag! I saw you crushing him in your arms. Is he dead? Mappo shook his head and said, Unconscious. I don't think he'll awaken for some time. Puss said, Then let the Azath take him. Now! We are within Tremorlor. Our need for him has ended. Mappo said, No. Puss shouted, Fool! <laughs> a bell clanged somewhere outside. They all looked at each other in disbelief. Fiddler wondered, Did we hear that? A merchant's bell? Puss growled, Why a merchant? Crocus nodded and said, a merchant's bell. In Darujistan, that is. Fiddler went to the door. From within, the latch moved smoothly under his hand, and he swung the door back. Thin sheets of tangled root now rose from the yard, towering over the house itself in a clash of angles and planes. Humped earth steamed on all sides. Waiting just outside the arch gate were three huge, ornate carriages, each drawn by nine white horses. A roundish figure stood beneath the arch, wearing silks. The figure raised a hand toward Fiddler and called out in Daru, Alas, I can go no farther. I assure you, all is calm out here. I seek the one named Fiddler. Fiddler barked, Why? The man, who we know as Carpolan, said, I deliver a gift, gathered in great haste and at vast expense, I might add. I suggest we complete the transaction as quickly as possible, all things considered. So this was his next stop. I wonder what warrens they took to get here. Oh, I know it. I am so growing impressed with Carpolin. He must be an extraordinary mage to do what he does, holding warrens open that are probably inimical to him, and passing three large carriages and 27 horses through them, not including the other shareholders. I mean, I hope we learn more about this guy in the future. Yeah, definitely. Obviously, very powerful, and just to have that level of insanity and yes. audacity even to go into these warrens that are hostile to you. Yes. It's really incredible, and <laughs> it's, definitely 
almost seems like they should have their own series, doesn't yeah. it? Like a yeah. side set of books. Yeah, we could have the adventures of the Trigal Trade Commission all day long, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Crocus now stood beside Fiddler, frowning at the carriages. He quietly said, I know the maker of those, Bernooks, just back of Lakefront. But I've never seen them that big before. Gods, I've been away too long. Fiddler sighed, Darujistan. Crocus said, I'm certain of it, shaking his head. Fiddler stepped outside and studied the surroundings. Things seemed, as the merchant had said, calm, quiescent. Still uneasy, Fiddler made his way down the path. He halted two paces from the archway and eyed the merchant warily. Carpolan Demisan, sir, of the Trigal Trade Guild. And this is a run that I and my shareholders shall never regret, yet hope never to repeat. <laughs> the man's exhaustion was very evident and his silks hung soaked in sweat. He gestured, and an armored woman with a deathly pale face stepped past him, carrying a small crate. Carpolan continued, compliments of a certain mage of the bridge burners, who was advised, in timely fashion, of your situation in a general way, by the corporal you share. So, Quick Ben took action after Kalam notified him that Fiddler was pursuing the entrance to Tremorlore. He realized Fiddler needed help due to the convergence of the Path of Hands. Yeah, nice, dude. Yeah, you know, it's really cool of him after he found out that Fiddler needed help that he gathered all this stuff and sent a assistance package, if you will. Yes, yeah, a nice care package. <laughs> Fiddler grinned as he accepted the box. He said, the efforts of this delivery surpass me, sir. Carpolan said, me as well, I assure you. Now we must flee. Ah, a rude bluntness. I meant depart, of course. We must depart. <laughs> He sighed, looked around, then said, Forgive me, I am weary, beyond even achieving the expected courtesies of civil discourse. Fiddler said, No need for apologies. While I have no idea how you got here, and no idea how you'll get back to Darujistan, I wish you a safe and swift journey. One last question, however. Did the maze say anything about where the contents of this crate came from? Carpolan said, Oh, indeed, he did, sir. From the Blue City Streets. An obscure reference you are clearly fortunate to understand in an instant, I see. Fiddler asked, Did the mage give you any warnings as to the handling of this package, Carpolan? Carpolan grimaced and said, He said we were not to jostle too much. However, this last stretch of our journey was somewhat rough. I regret to say that some of the crate's contents may well be broken. <laughs> so much for full disclosure of the dangers of what's going on here. They didn't get an MSDS sheet, apparently, about what is in this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the great thing about this is I'm, I'm assuming it, it, they all must be okay, because if they were handled too rough, I'm assuming they would not have arrived with said package. Absolutely. I don't think any of those carriages would have made it out of there if one of these things went off. No, no. <laughs> Fiddler smiled and said, I am pleased to inform you that they have survived. Carpolan frowned and said, you have not yet examined the contents. How can you tell? Fiddler said, you'll just have to trust me on that one, sir. <laughs> Crocus closed the door once Fiddler had carried the crate inside. Fiddler gingerly set the container down and prized open the lid. He whispered, ah, quick then, as his eyes scanned the objects nestled within. He said, one day I shall raise a temple in your name. He counted seven cussers, 13 masonry crackers, and four flamers. Man, <laughs> that's pretty awesome. <laughs> yes, it is. And that goes to my previous point. Even Fiddler noted that he says, uh, yeah, they're all intact, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Take my word for it. Yes. They're all intact. <laughs> Crocus asked, but how did that merchant get here? From Darujistan, hood's breath, Fid. Fiddler said, don't I know it, and glanced at the others. He said, I'm feeling good, comrades, very good indeed. A Malazan sapper fully equipped with Maranth munitions, one of the deadliest forces the world has ever seen. Absolutely. I believe that if these guys were to come to our planet, <laughs> even with our modern equipment, I think these guys would still mess us up, man. It'd be, especially if they came in here with somebody like the rest of the bridge burners or a car on with them, please. We may not stand a chance. <laughs> I don't know. Modern rifles and stuff, they have quite the range on them. They do, but they got mages, dude. True. They have protective barriers. Yeah. Yeah, the mages are scary and such unknowns. Puss snarled, optimism, in a tone close to bursting with disgust. He yanked at the wispy remnants of his hair and shouted, while that foul monkey pisses terror into the lad's lap, optimism? 
Crocus now held Moby out from him and stared disbelieving at the stream pouring down to splash the flagstones. He said, Moby? The creature was grinning sheepishly. It's like a little infant <laughs> troublemaker. Yeah. It's kind of like those little, like when you get a little puppy dog, can't stop urinating everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Puss shouted, soul taken, you mean. Apslar said, a momentary lapse, as she eyed the squirming creature. She said, the realization of what has come about, that or an odd sense of humor. Puss demanded, what are you babbling about? Apslar said, he thought he'd found the path thought that what called him here was the ancient promise of ascendancy, and in a way, Moby was right in thinking that. The Baccaral there in your hands, Crocus, is demonic. In true form, it could hold you as you now hold it. Mappo grunted, Ah, I see now. Crocus snapped, Then why not enlighten us? Apslar nudged the corpse at her feet and said, Tremorlor needed a new guardian. Need I be any clearer? Crocus blinked, looking again at Moby, the trembling creature in his hands. He asked, my uncle's familiar? Apsilar said, a demon. At the moment, somewhat intimidated by expectation, we might assume. But I'm sure the creature will grow into the role. Fiddler had been packing the Maranth munitions into his leather sack while this had been going on. Now he rose and gingerly swung the bag over his shoulder. I have no idea how you could get used to that much power in a backpack. Can we get a round of applause for good old PTSD here? (laughs) Yeah, I guess humans just adapt to being in situations. It becomes the new normal for them. I guess even having this much firepower on your back, you get used to it after a while. Yeah, I think you're right. You get kind of used to doing things that you're not used to carrying around a bunch of firepower and go, hey, hey, I'll be okay with this. I've carried this before. So, yeah, they're going to be okay. (laughs) Yeah. Fiddler said, Quick Ben believed we'd find a portal somewhere in here, a Warren's Gate. Pust crowed, linking the house? Outrageous audacity. This cunning mage of yours has charmed me, soldier. He should have been a servant of shadow. Fiddler thought, he was, but never mind that. If your god's of a mind to, he'll tell you, though, I wouldn't hold my breath. <laughs> Fiddler said, it's time to find that portal. Apslar said, to the T-intersection, down the left passage to the two doors. The one to the left takes us into the tower, top floor. She smiled. Fiddler stared at her a moment, then nodded. He thought, your borrowed memories. Moby led the way, revealing a return of nerve and something like possessive pride. Just beyond the intersection, in the left-hand passage, there was an alcove set in the wall, on which hung resplendent scale armor suited to a wearer over ten foot tall and of massive girth. Two double-bladed axes leaned against the niche walls, one to either side. Moby paused there to play a tiny loving hand over one iron-sheathed boot before wistfully moving on. Crocus stumbled in passing as it momentarily gripped his full attention. That's an interesting reaction from Moby. Very interesting. Upon opening the door, they entered the tower's ground floor. A stone staircase spiraled up from its center. At the foot of the saddleback steps lay another body, a young, dark-skinned woman who looked as if she had been placed there but an hour before. She was dressed in what were clearly underclothes, though the armor that had once covered them was nowhere to be seen. Vicious wounds crisscrossed her slight form. Apsilar approached, crouched down, and rested a hand on the girl's shoulder. She whispered, I know her. Relok growled, eh? Apsilar said, the memory of the one who possessed me, father. His mortal memory. Fiddler said, dancer. She nodded and said, this is Dasim Ultor's daughter. Dasim Ultor. The first sword recovered her after Hood was done using her and brought her here, it seems. Fiddler said, before breaking his vow to Hood. Apslar said, aye, before Dasim cursed the god he once served. Fiddler said, that was years ago, Apslar. Apslar said, I know. What? This takes us all the way back to the prologue of Gardens of the Moon. Yeah. After asking about the death of Dasim Ultor, a young Ganoes said to Whiskey Jack, it said he betrayed a god. Mm. Later in the book, Tattersail was in conversation with Whiskey Jack. She said, back in Seven Cities, the story goes that the Emperor's first sword, his commander of his armies, Dasim Ultor, had accepted a god's offer. Hood made Dasim his knight of death. Then something happened. Something went wrong. 
And Dasim renounced the title, swore a vow of vengeance against Hood, against the Lord of Death himself. All at once, other ascendants started meddling, manipulating events. It all culminated with Dasim's murder, then the Emperor's assassination, and blood in the streets, temples at war, sorceries unleashed. End quote. Earlier in this book, during the conversation where Absalar revealed to Fiddler that Kelonved and Dancer had ascended, she also said, Dancer trusted but two men. One was Kelonved, the other was Dasim Ultor, the first sword. Dasim is dead. End quote. Given Absalar has Dancer's memories, I imagine this must be quite a shock to come across Dasim's daughter here. Also, her seemingly being in stasis since the incident that led to Dasim renouncing his vow to Hood would add to that as well. And I'd forgotten all about this. I forgot all about Dasim's daughter being here. It's wow. <laughs> she must have been here at least 10 years because it's been about that long, hasn't it? Since Ganoas was on the parapet in the prologue of Gardens of the Moon. Yeah, this is what, seven, eight years? Seven, let's just call it maybe nine to 10 at this point. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. And it seems like it's only been an hour. So this gives yeah. you a sense of what's going on with time within the Azath. Also, I was thinking back to Gardens of the Moon. Is it confirmed that Ralik Nam and Vorkin went into the Azath there? Yes, they did. Okay, interesting. If I'm not mistaken, that's how Gardens of the Moon kind of ends right around there, not too far after when they walk into that thing together. So for it to admit them, that's interesting as well. What's that say about them? Yeah. Well, we know who the Azath was there for. They were there for raced. That's why the Azath popped up. Right. But for it to even allow entry for those other two is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. That's a weird thing unless they're supposed to be the guardians of, the, of that Azath. No, I think the guardian had already been selected when they went in. Probably. Yeah, I think you're right. The group was silent, all studying the frail young woman lying at the foot of the stairs. Mappo shifted Akarium's weight in his arms, as if uneasy with the echo he knew he had become, even though it was understood that he would not do with his burden what Dasim Ultor had done. Absalar straightened and cast her eyes up the staircase. She said, If Dancer's memory serves, the portal awaits. Fiddler swung to the others. He said, Mappo, you will join us? Mappo said, aye, though perhaps not all the way, assuming there's a means to leave that warren when one so chooses. Fiddler said, quite an assumption. Mappo simply shrugged. So Mappo pictures the Azath forming a network, if you will, each allowing for ingress and egress based on the choice of the person entering the warren. I wonder how you know which door you'll end up at. Maybe it takes your intent like the Imperial Warren did with Kalam, you think? That's going to be my guess. Is Yeah, it has to be intent because that's the only thing that would make sense to me. Okay. It seems like you could get in quite a bit of trouble <laughs> getting access to this network. Think about all the places you could go. Oh, yeah. Sounds like you could stumble into some really... Well, as a matter of fact, there is some... In the new series about the Witness trilogy, there is some shenanigans in the nazath <laughs> okay i guess i won't be able to read that for several years till he finishes the third one yes <laughs> yes you will you'll have to wait a little i'm bit. not gonna make the same mistake you made good sir <laughs> fiddler said is girl pussed puss said oh i of course of course why not why ever not to walk the maze back out insanity is girl pussed is anything but insane as you all well know i i shall accompany you and silently add to not but myself. Perhaps an opportunity for betrayal will yet arise. Betray what? Betray whom? Does it matter? It is not the goal that brings pleasure, but the journey taken to achieve it. <laughs> Fiddler met Crocus's sharp gaze. He said, watch him. Crocus said, I shall. <laughs> Fiddler then glanced down at Moby, the familiar squatted by the doorway, quietly playing with its own tail. He asked, how does one say goodbye to a Baccarol? Puss said, with a boot in the backside, how else? <laughs> <laughs> Fiddler asked, care to try that with this one? Puss scowled, but made no move. <laughs> Crocus said, he was out there when we traveled the storms, wasn't he? He approached the tiny, wizened creature and continued, recall those battles we could not see? He was protecting us all along. Fiddler said, aye. Moby must be incredibly strong to have survived all that. 
given the stuff that we saw. Right. And think about that. It, as far as we can tell, there doesn't appear to be so much as a mark on him. So he must be real powerful. I think it did mention that he looked scratched up, but not seriously injured. Oh, okay. That's right. That is true. He was a little, a little, little chewed, a little, little rough for the wear. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's a good way to put it. Pust hissed, ulterior motives. Fiddler said, nonetheless. Crocus gathered Moby into his arms and said, God's he'll be lonely. There was no shame to the tears in Crocus's eyes. Blinking, Fiddler turned away, grimacing as he studied the staircase. He said, it'll do you no good to draw it out, Crocus. Crocus whispered, I'll find a way to visit. Apslar said, think on what you see, Crocus. He looks content enough. As for being alone, how do you know that that will be the case? There are other houses, other guardians. Crocus nodded. Slowly, he released his grip on the familiar and set it down. He said, with luck, there won't be any crockery lying around. <laughs> Apslar said, what? Crocus smiled and said, Moby always had bad luck around crockery, or should I say it the other way around? He rested a hand on the creature's blunt, hairless head, then rose. He said, let's go. And that's sad that he's got to leave his pet behind like that. It is. Yeah, because I love Moby. I love that guy. Good on Moby for taking on this big role as a guardian of an Azath. Who would have ever thought that would be the case? <laughs> right? I agree. That's a great twist, a great turnaround event, and I, and I think a great fate for Moby. Definitely. Moby watched the group ascend the stairs. A moment later, there was a midnight flash from above, and they were gone. The creature listened carefully, cocking its tiny head, but there was no more sound from the chamber above. It sat unmoving for a few more minutes, idly plucking at its own tail, then swung about and scampered into the hallway, coming to a stop before the suit of armor. The massive, closed great helm tilted with a soft creak, and a ragged voice came from it. I am pleased my solitude is at an end, little one. Tremorlore welcomes you with all its heart, even if you have made a mess on the hallway floor. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder who or what this thing is. I wonder too. Is this why Moby touched that boot? I'm guessing because he was he knew something was inside that armor. Absolutely, he had known that this was some type of sentient being or magically imbued item as he walked by. Yeah, I'm guessing because of his long employment for a mammoth in Darugistan, maybe he just was very sensitive to magic and so, so knew it was imbued or, th or that there might be someone in there like that. Possibly. I also just had another realization. I don't think Moby cares particularly about cleanliness. What is this Azath going to look like after a couple months? Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he would probably make a mess there after. Yes. Well, yeah, because where else is he going to go to the toilet? So Yes. All right. We're going to stop there and we'll <laughs> continue the chapter next week. For standout moments, Ikarium's Warren being channeled through his sword, the way it was vibrating, that was a really interesting concept. I thought that was pretty cool. Yes, I really enjoyed that too. And uh, I, like I said, I think I, I keep referring to the fact that this makes Ikarium a lot like the Elric stuff. I love the idea of, it, of him channeling through his sword for some reason. That's, that's a, I don't think we've seen that happen yet, yet, or I don't know if we ever see it again. In very interesting. Mm -hmm. Tremolore making a move to capture the hounds. I really appreciated that. Yeah, does this mean that they're that the Azath are opportunistic hunters? Absolutely. Right on. Tremolore opening for Moby of all things. Who would have thought that was going to happen? <laughs> oh, I know it. I just love that. That was so cool. And I've always liked Moby so much. And then we don't really see him that much, and he can be kind of annoying. But I, I know it's very personal for. Um, Crocus, because, you know, this is kind of his last hold on his beloved city of Jerugistan while he's away from there, and any even a last link to his deceased uncle. Also, childhood pet, so definitely a uh, sad goodbye for him. Yes, very much. I appreciated getting one more drop of info about the Fork Rule of Sale. It was just a drop, <laughs> but it was better than nothing. It was just a drop, and I agree. That was just, it was so, I'm always so satisfied. I love getting this stuff. It's what's so funny when I think about the multi-jointed with the Forkwell Assail in particular. I've been watching stuff on the Honey Badgers and how those guys can almost turn around in their own skin. They're so loose. 
skinned. And I, I don't know why I've got this image in my brain now about these fellas being loose skinned like this too. I know they're not. It's just just kind of going it through my brain. Mm, almost ferret like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, kind of. It was really cool of Quick Ben to send Fiddler the munitions to help him out, though it was a little bit after he needed them. But still, it was a really cool gesture. Absolutely. I just really love finally getting to, you know, we, we needed, Fiddler needed some more ammo, dude. Yeah, he's going to make it the rest of this trip if he don't have some ammo. It's, it's just so super sweet that, that Quick Ben was looking out for this buddy. Finding Dasim Ultor's daughter in stasis within Tremolor. What a surprise that was. That's a huge surprise. And just one that just kind of rocks me because I still want to know how how does, we've talked about this in the past, how does Dasim Ultor expect to get revenge on Hood? As far as we know, he's dead. Well, that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> So I guess he didn't get his revenge. I guess he didn't get his revenge. <laughs> Unless he's doing it in the afterlife. Well, that's true. Maybe he's <laughs> he maybe that was part of the plan. Go to Hood. <laughs> that was part of the plan. He just he went to he got killed so he could go take out Hood in his own realm. <laughs> I enjoyed finding out that Moby was protecting the party as they journeyed across seven cities. That really is a testament to his power, given all the dangerous creatures that were out there. Yes, because he man, we know that there was some very large soul taken and divers that were on these guys' trails in this last, especially these last two chapters when they all they do is hear all the howling and wailing and the fighting and to realize that basically Moby's the one out there out in the dark whooping and kicking butt and, uh, and protected them for that whole time. That is so cool. Agreed. And then finally, learning that Moby is not alone in Tremor after all. I want to know more about that suit of armor. Yeah, me too. And I, I really like this part here because I did not like the idea of Moby having to be by himself. You know, the, the, the Baccarat in particular seem like very social creatures. They're like cats with wings and thumbs, <laughs> but uh, very social. Yeah, I kind of get that too. <laughs> All right, Billy, great job tonight. Hey, great episode, man. Always a pleasure. Great. It's such a great chapter, man. Yeah, you got any final thoughts before we drop off here? No, just great episode. I look so forward to next week as we get deeper into this chapter because, man, we're getting we're getting it done, dude. We ain't got much longer. No. It's just very exciting as it just keeps ratcheting up. Yeah, we're getting real close. All right, thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. We'll see you all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us, and we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.